So, in today's lecture I am going to discuss uh, an alternative to the Lagrangian approach which we discussed in the earlier lecture. So, if you recall the uh, Lagrangian approach to classical mechanics uh, involves rewriting the vector form of the Newton's second law in terms of uh, quantities which are purely scalars and these are called Lagrangians and the Lagrange, uh, the Lagrangian obeys a certain uh, set of equations which are called the Euler-Lagrange equations. Now, um, the main advantage uh, uh, of the Lagrange equations over Newton's laws is that the constraint forces uh, in Lagrange formalism uh, do not have to be explicitly specified because that is typically how most interesting problems in classical mechanics are formulated uh, by just specifying that the system uh, obeys certain constraints or it is a constraint to move in a certain way uh, rather than specifying the forces that uh, uh, compel those particles to move in that fashion. So, whereas Newton's second law forces you to know what those forces are that uh, compel those particles to move in that fashion. So, that is the main advantage of using the Lagrange formalism. and. Uh, it so happens that there is an equivalent formalism which uh, is typically more useful uh, for especially for uh, generalizing to quantum mechanics, but also within classical mechanics itself it has uh, many advantages in the sense that it uh, allows you to study symmetries in a, a more convincing and transparent manner. So, that is the formulation of the Hamiltonian mechanics, the Hamilton's formulation of classical mechanics which I am going to discuss. So, superficially the distinction between the two can be uh, captured by the following assertion namely that uh, the Lagrange equations, the Euler-Lagrange equations of classical mechanics are second order. Uh, in other words that if you write them down the uh, it will involve uh, two time derivatives of the generalized coordinates just like Newton's second law does. So, if you recall Newton's second law is uh, mass times acceleration is force. So, what is acceleration? Acceleration is nothing but the second time derivative of the position coordinate, but uh, basically Euler-Lagrange equation pretty much says the same thing except it says that something analogous to mass times the second derivative of the generalized coordinate equals generalized force. So, it is it is basically a curvilinear analog of Newton's second law except that uh, those generalized coordinates already obey constraints. So, that the generalized forces do not involve uh, forces of constraint. So, that is the main advantage otherwise the analogy between Newton's second law and uh, the Euler-Lagrange equations is uh, pretty much one to one. Okay, uh, however, uh, in contrast the Hamilton's formulation of uh, classical mechanics recasts these equations in terms of uh, two first order equations. So, in other words instead of having one second order equation you write them as two first order equations which of course effectively is uh, uh, especially if they are coupled which they in fact are in this case the uh, two first order equations is basically equivalent to one a second order equation. So, uh, so I am going to describe uh, to you uh, the relation between Hamilton's formulation of classical mechanics and the Lagrangian mechanics uh, and they are related by this uh, beautiful mathematical notion uh, called uh, the Legendre transformation. So, I am going to describe what it is and I uh, will I'll tell you that it has a very beautiful and intuitively appealing uh, geometrical meaning. So, the Legendre transformation can be visualized in a very geometrical way and that is uh, quite appealing and interesting to know. Okay, uh, so, in order to uh, develop the Hamilton's approach to classical mechanics, I am going to introduce to you the concept of Legendre transformation. So, I hope you can see my slides. So, if you can, you can uh, make out that I have written down that uh, imagine that there is a function L of v is a function of uh, some some uh, variable called v and uh, 
So, the idea is that uh, I am going to introduce a notion called convex function. So, a convex function is basically something that uh, looks like this. I mean basically anything that looks like this. Uh, so, this would be convex. Okay. So, rather than this, this would be concave. So, uh, so specifically the mathematically what it means is that you are saying the second derivative of uh, the um, function is positive at all points. So, the slope continuously increases as v increases the slope increases rather than decreases. Okay. So, uh, so then you say it is convex. So, if you have such a convex function one can define formally another function which is uh, basically the uh, maximum value of uh, so right now this this definition is not very um, intuitive but i'm going to tell you that it has a very uh, well defined geometrical meaning but analytically uh, you can define h of p as the maximum value of uh, p times p so p is uh, a, a fixed quantity and v is your variable. Okay. So, v is your variable and I maximize uh, with respect to v. So, I change v until this becomes maximum and the reason why that is guaranteed to exist is because uh, if you uh, look at the first derivative. So, when does an extremum exist? Uh, the extremum exists at v equal to v star where the derivative of this vanishes. So, in other words uh, that is what I have told you that uh, so if you think of g of v as this difference then the, the place at which uh, the function becomes an extremum. So, extremum recall for a single variable is either maximum or minimum. So, at this stage uh, equating the first derivative to 0 uh, just uh, guarantees that that point uh, is an extremum. It does not guarantee that it is a minimum but right now it guarantees that it is an extremum. So, in other words it is either a minimum or a maximum. So, now what is the value of v and uh, clearly that, that value is obtained by the solution of uh, this equation. So, by inverting this correspondence you will be successful in finding uh, the extremum. But then uh, I want to convince you that uh, that extremum is in fact uh, the maximum right. So, because it is supposed to be the maximum value. So, why is that the maximum because if you take the second derivative. So, if you take the second derivative of g it is simply uh, minus l dash dash at v star is not it because uh, p times v second derivative is 0 because uh, p times v is linear in v. So, the first derivative is constant the second derivative is 0. So, the only term that contributes to the second derivative is uh, the one uh, with the Lagrangian. So, so in other words uh, g dash dash uh, v star is basically equal to this. Okay. So, the bottom line is that uh, because the function is convex because it is convex. Uh, so, in other words it is not this rather it is this. So, because it is convex L dash dash is positive. Okay. So, because L dash dash is positive G dash dash is negative and you know when second derivative is negative the function is a maximum. right? If it is an extremum and the second derivative is negative the function is a maximum. So, um, so that, that makes sense. So, the H, HP's definition therefore makes sense because there does indeed exist a maximum. So, uh, so we are not making a mistake, we are not uh, assuming more than we know. So, we have to assume that there is a maximum only when we know beforehand that there in fact is a maximum. We just convinced ourselves that there is a maximum. Okay. Um, so, now uh, that is the definition therefore of h of p is that, uh, so h of p is uh, p times v star minus l of v star and v star is the place where g of v becomes a maximum. Okay. So, now uh, 
So, now this is the analytical description. So, this is called the Hamiltonian. Okay. So, this is called the Hamiltonian. Just like this is called the Lagrangian. So, they, they are named after different scientists. But the question is that um, you know the, the claim that I am going to make is the following that imagine uh, think of L of V as this sort of curve. So, this is L versus L versus V. So, it is some convex curve is not it. So, it is a convex curve. So, it means it, it uh, points upward like that. So, and then uh, the thing is that in order to specify this convex curve, you can do the traditional obvious thing namely you specify the x coordinate of some point that is the horizontal coordinate of some point and its uh, vertical coordinate. So, if by specifying the horizontal and the vertical coordinates that is the uh, abscissa and the ordinates, you will be uh, successful in locating all the points on the curve L of V. So, that is the usual traditional way of drawing a curve. You just locate the horizontal and the vertical coordinates of each point and then you uh, draw points at, at those places and then you join them all using a smooth uh, curve. So, that is how you would uh, think of L of V in the traditional way. But then there is another way of uh, thinking about a, a convex curve like this and the way to think about it is not uh, by specifying the points themselves uh, like we did just now, but uh, by specifying the uh, set of all straight lines that are tangent to this curve. So, I am going to convince you that uh, specifying a whole bunch of straight lines each of which are tangent to the curve at uh, different different points is equivalent to specifying the curve itself. So, why is that? So, the reason why that is the case is because so just imagine that this is one such straight line which is clearly tangent to the curve at this point. Now, you can imagine another straight line like this which is tangent to the curve at this point. So, then you can imagine another straight line which is tangent to the curve at this point. So, if I specify so if I collect all these straight lines, right? I collect all these straight lines and then I put them in one in one place and then I just collect. So, just like in order to draw the curve, I am collecting all the bunch of points, right? So, so basically I, I, in order to specify the curve, the usual way of doing it is to collect all those bunch of points and put them together in some place and then uh, deal with them. But instead of doing that, what I am doing is I am going to collect a bunch of straight lines and then I am going to put them all together in a certain way. And the way to do that is, uh, so first draw those straight lines on a piece of paper and then ask yourself which is that single curve which I can draw that is tangent to all these straight lines. So, so, if you are able to draw such a curve, then basically that curve is exactly what you, you are going to describe using those points. So, instead of, so what you have done is you have been successful in uh, replacing that point description of the curve using uh, the tangent description. So, in other words, rather than specifying the points on the curve, what you have done is you have replaced those points by a bunch of tangents and what you are saying now is that uh, the curve that I am looking for is that curve which is simultaneously tangent to all these straight lines at whatever points uh, they want to be tangent at. So, now I am going to convince you that these two ways of looking at the curve are in fact equivalent. Okay. So, so how do I convince you about that? So, that is exactly what the that is the geometrical interpretation of the Hamiltonian. Okay. So, now imagine that there is some V star uh, 
So imagine this is my V star and then there is a at this point there is a straight line which is tangent to this curve. So now I am going to ask myself what what are the slope? So obviously a straight line is described by two numbers. One is the slope of the straight line and the other is the y intercept that means the vertical intercept and the slope. So that is what uh, if you recall from our high school days that that is how we have defined or uh, choose to describe straight lines, is not it? So if, we, if I wanted to analytically describe a straight line, I would describe it by uh, specifying the slope and the uh, y intercept. So now I am going to ask myself what is the slope of this straight line that is tangent to this L of v. Clearly that slope is nothing but L dash of v which happens to be exactly p. So remember that L dash of v star is nothing but p. So, so this is, so if I specify the slope of the straight line uh, that is bound to be equal to by definition the derivative of uh, this L of v at v star. So now I am going to ask myself uh, what is the y intercept. So I am going to call the y intercept the point at which the straight line intersects the vertical axis as 0 times at 0 comma minus h. So when I do that clearly the equation for the straight line now becomes, so this is the w is the some point on the straight line that is this is my w. So w is nothing but the slope y equals mx plus c. So this is y and this is my slope which is m which happens I have called it p but so if you are used to y equals mx plus c that this would be x, this would be m, this would be c and this would be y. So that is what that is. So it is a straight line whose uh, slope is nothing but L dash v which is also equal to p and the y intercept is minus h. So that is my straight line. So the claim is that uh, rather than specifying v and l v, what I am going to do is, uh, so if I specify uh, uh, a whole bunch of uh, these things, right, so then I am of course going to specify the curve. So this is a certain point, uh, this is a certain different point and so on and so forth. So by specifying all these points, I can clearly uh, uh, draw a smooth uh, curve through that and that would be my L of v. But the claim here is that alternatively instead of doing this, instead of specifying v comma L of v, what I can do is I can specify p comma h of p which is equivalent and what is p? It is the slope of the straight line that is tangent to this uh, curve that I am eventually going to generate. So there is a slope, so rather than specifying v and l v, so I am going to specify the slope of a whole bunch of straight lines and those straight lines are all going to be simultaneously tangent to the curve that I have in mind. So this is the slope and then uh, minus h is pretty much the y intercept of that straight line. So I am specifying slope and intercept. So for there are there is one straight line whose slope is p1 and whose y intercept is minus h p1. So by specifying both that straight line now becomes unique because there is only one straight line with slope p1 and y intercept minus h p1. So similarly I can generate a different straight line whose uh, slope is p2 and the y intercept is minus h p2. So now I have uh, in this way of doing things, I am generating a whole bunch of straight lines. Now I am going to ask myself which is that curve that is tangent to all these straight lines at the same time. In other words, but they are going to be tangent at different points, but then they are simultaneously tangent to all these straight lines. And the answer is precisely this, the curve that you generate through this procedure.
So that is because the H's and the P's have been generated through the L's if you recall. So, uh, so this is the geometrical meaning of Legendre transformation. So, the transformation that uh, we are talking about now is the transformation from the V L of V language to the P H of P language. So, from the, uh, the language of specifying points on the curve in the usual way to the language of specifying the curve indirectly by specifying the slope and the y intercept or the vertical intercept of the tangents to the curve that those uh, straight lines uh, eventually imply. So, in other words there is going to be a curve which is finally going to be tangent to all those straight lines at the same time. So, you either specify the curve directly by specifying v and l of v or you specify this whole bunch of straight lines and then there is always going to be a unique curve that is going to be tangent to all these straight lines uh, at various points. Okay, so, this is the uh, Hamiltonian uh, formulation of, uh, so of course you might think that where is uh, physics here. So, the physics comes if I interpret L of V, L as my Lagrangian and V as my generalized velocity. Or the, uh, so, if, if V is L of V, then clearly uh, L dash V is, uh, is basically the usual way of defining canonical momentum and uh, so uh, H of P will then become the Hamiltonian. So, that is called the Hamiltonian. So, this is how uh, Hamiltonians are formally introduced into classical mechanics and this is the geometrical interpretation. Okay, uh, so in, in my textbook I have made some uh, other technical statements about invertibility that you have to convince yourself that uh, this correspondence is invertible. So, that, so, in other words if you go from the L uh, V comma L of V language to P comma H of P language and then you should be able to do the reverse. So, if I start from the P of H of P language. I should be able to get back the V uh, comma L of V description as well. So, uh, so I have intuitively convinced you that that is in fact possible, but there is also a mathematical rigorous way of doing that which is described in my book here which I will uh, encourage you to read because uh, the textbook that I am using right now which is uh, being displayed in front of you is the prescribed textbook. So, you please consult uh, the relevant uh, page number 9 of my textbook has this uh, uh, mathematical proof which tells you why it is that it is uh, this correspondence is invertible. Okay, so, so, remember that uh, L of V implies that uh, the Lagrangian is a function of generalized velocity. I have purposely suppressed another uh, independent variable namely the generalized uh, rather the position itself. So, you see the, so you know that the Lagrangian is actually not just a function of q dot which is your generalized velocity, it is also a function of q. So, uh, but because q does not play any role in this uh, geometrical description of the Legendre transformation, I purposely suppress that, but now I can go ahead and bring it back. So, if I bring it back my Lagrangian uh, is going to be not only a function of the generalized velocity which is v which is of course q dot, but it is also a function of uh, yeah. So, it is also a function of the generalized coordinate itself which is q. So, as a result of course, uh, that same uh, dependence carries over into the Hamiltonian as well because uh, after all that q was anyway suppressed earlier. So, it should it should uh, once you explicitly display it, it should also be displayed also inside the Hamiltonian bracket. So, so the Hamiltonian is not only a function of p which is the slope of L, L versus v, but it is also of course, a function of the generalized coordinate. So, I write h p comma q to emphasize this point.
So, now recall that the Lagrange equations were uh, basically this. So, this is uh, like I told you, you know, this, is, this has a very close resemblance to Newton's second law because what this is is generalized momentum uh, and this is generalized force. So, rate of change of generalized d by d t p equals f. So, d by d t of generalized momentum is uh, generalized force. So, it is pretty much uh, Newton's second law in disguise and uh, but of course, uh, the disguise is uh, a very efficient disguise in the sense that it gets rid of aspects that you are anyway not privy to namely the forces of constraints. All right, so, uh, so now what I am going to do is that I know how h is expressed in terms of l. So, I am going to invert that and express l in terms of h. Uh, so, that is easy to do because all, all I have to do is invert this and if I do that, uh, so I am going to use this uh, inversion to uh, see what it is uh, if I can rewrite the Lagrange equations in terms of my newly generated Hamiltonian. So, how would I do that? I define L of uh, V like this and then the derivative of L of V uh, uh, with respect to V uh, which is the V is if you remember is the generalized velocity which is Q dot and that is going to be nothing but. Uh, so, so remember that this P star ok. So, what is P star? P star is uh, basically ok, I, I think I, I should not have skipped this, but bottom line is that just like you can uh, define the Hamiltonian as the maximum value of uh, P times V minus L. Similarly, uh, you can define the Lagrangian as the maximum value by varying P as P times V minus H of P. So, it is completely invertible, these, uh, these relations are completely invertible and the maximum takes place exactly at some p equal to p star uh, which is basically given by the solution to the equation v equals d by d p of h of p ok. So, uh, yeah, so this is this uh, page number 9 is not fully cosmetic I mean it is not some pedantic discussion of invertibility because I am going to use this idea in the very next page. So, I feel it is worthwhile for you to go through this carefully. So, bottom line is that just like there was a uh, V star which was basically the uh, value of V at which uh, uh, the that function G became an extremum here too uh, there is a P star which makes uh, the analogous function an extremum that is P times V minus H of p now becomes an extremum as you vary p. So, uh, if you uh, keep that in mind then obviously, uh, this p star is now going to be a function of the v that because uh, so clearly what is uh, how do you define p p star p star is determined indirectly through this. So, if you invert this uh, whatever I have circled here. So, you will get p star in terms of V. So, which is why I have written P star as a function of V there. So, now uh, I take the derivative of L with respect to V and uh, I end up getting P star and then I should not forget to differentiate uh, P star because now that also is a function of V and uh, I end up getting this uh, this relation. But then keep in mind that uh, d by d h of p is nothing but v. So, because this is nothing but v these two will cancel out and then it will give me this ok. So, d l by d v is p star ok. And uh, furthermore uh, it is obvious that d l by d q right is uh, minus uh, d h by d q and why is that? Uh, that is uh, that is fairly obvious because uh, you see uh, it is it's L is uh, L is defined uh, L is defined as uh, p star v 
so uh, so h is a function of q right so so the the q dependence now is uh, here okay okay sorry i am messing up so i'm just going to this, this one so l of l uh, the L of V is basically uh, P star times V minus H of P star which happens to depend on Q. So now if I take the derivative uh, with respect to Q, so DL by DQ is nothing but minus DH by DQ. Okay. Yeah, so just take DL by DQ here you will see that Q is only sitting here nowhere else. So then that is what you get here. Okay. So as a result uh, what we will be successful in doing is that so this, this equation is nothing but D by DT of P is DL by DQ but then what is DL by DQ it is minus DH by DQ. So, this is the first equation first of the Hamiltonian equations then of course uh, dh by dp uh, itself is uh, nothing but v right. So, uh, but then what is uh, what is uh, v it is nothing but q dot. So, so what is happening now is that you have uh, instead of one uh, second order equation you have two first order equations involving p and q. So, in the Lagrangian formalism there was uh, one second order equation involving only q which is the generalized coordinate. Now, you have two first order equations involving generalized momentum as well as generalized coordinate. Okay, uh, so, this is the um, so called Hamilton's uh, approach to classical mechanics. But notice that uh, in both uh, the uh, Lagrangian approach to classical mechanics as well as uh, the Hamilton's approach to classical mechanics, uh, the uh, forces of constraints are explicitly omitted. So, they are uh, superior to uh, Newton's second law of, uh, for uh, studying classical systems for this reason. So, namely that uh, uh, you do not have to know beforehand uh, what are the forces of constraints acting on the system. So, even without knowing that you will be uh, able to find the trajectory of all the particles in the system which is basically the fundamental question that is of interest in classical mechanics is to just explicitly work out the trajectory of each of the particles knowing the initial state of the system. So, the answer to that question uh, is facilitated uh, by both the Lagrangian as well as the Hamiltonian approach because uh, both these approaches do not explicitly require you to know the forces of constraints whereas Newton's second law uh, requires you to know what the forces of constraint are. Okay, so, uh, so I am going to stop here and uh, in the next class I am going to uh, discuss uh, what are called flows and symmetries. So, the Hamilton's uh, description of classical systems enables a very elegant uh, description of uh, symmetries and in fact, uh, the Hamilton's equations themselves uh, describe a kind of flow, but the flow is with respect to time. So, the, so these P's and Q's are flowing with respect to time, but then the independent variable can be something other than time which enables us to study uh, certain kinds of symmetries called dynamical symmetries in a very elegant way. So, I am going to uh, describe that in the next class uh, and uh, I hope you will join me for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm.